Hiya, so today I'm going to be talking about an English garden in Rome. So the Farnese Gardens in Rome and the institution of the Venerable English College from 1550 to the present. So this is a view here that most people can immediately recognise. So Carlo Labruzzi's unfinished watercolour, held in the Catherine Bellinger collection in Munich, shows a sweeping view from Palatine Hill across to the Colosseum in Rome. Several well-dressed figures, unfinished, are depicted at the bottom of the scene. A couple enjoying a walk with a view and two stationary figures, one of whom appears to be drawing or painting the vista of the Colosseum in a micro replication of what Labruzzi himself must have done in the creation of his watercolour. The vantage point required to gain this view is clearly a popular location and it's not hard to see why. But where exactly are we? A similar view can still be seen from today, albeit slightly more obscure by the tree line. Taken from inside the archaeological site of the Forum, this photo similarly shows the view from Palatine Hill. This vantage point comes from the Farnese Gardens on the top of the Palatine, which are still excellent today inside the archaeological site of the Forum. The gardens were constructed in 1550 by Alessandro Farnese, when he had the ruins of a Roman palace of Tiberius redeveloped into a summer villa. Adjoining this was one of the first private botanical gardens in Europe. So the appeal of this plot of land as a location to build a garden as a summer villa is clear. The raised aspect sitting atop the Palatine Hill provides an impressive view over the Colosseum, an arch of Titus, making it a perfect vista for an illustrious papal family to survey the glory of Rome. This here from the 1748 Nolly map of Rome bears the phrase Villa Farnesiana, the Farnese Villa, which sits nightly atop the Palatine Hill, the Palatino, with the Colosseum marked over here in 934 with the Amphitheatro Flavio. The raised aspect is even clearer when you are down in the Roma Forum itself. The photo on the bottom left shows that it is extremely raised up, giving it an impressive view over the site below. So how exactly did this become an English garden? The Venerable English College, which had close ties to the Farnese family who built the gardens, purchased the land from the Farnese family in the 17th century. The English College has a long history, being established in 1362 as the English Hospice in Rome, providing accommodation from English, for English and Welsh pilgrims to the city, for the rich and poor alike. The hospice was sustained by full endowment, including an extensive property portfolio which came to include several gardens in the Palatine area by the 17th century. In 1579, the hospice was formally founded as a seminary for the training of English and Welsh Catholic priests, after the English Reformation saw the flow of pilgrims impeded and aspiring Catholic clergy no longer able to train in England. Throughout the centuries, it has also still maintained its function as a hospice, welcoming pilgrims such as Thomas Hobbes and John Milton. Today, it still functions as a seminary, though its property portfolio was lost during the Napoleonic era when the French invaded and seized the college and its assets. As the oldest surviving English institution outside the kingdom, the survival of the college's unique archives show us much about the relationship with the Farnese family, as well as the history of the gardens and the intercultural dynamics at play between an English institution abroad and its host country. So if we go back to the 1748 map of Rome, the college since 1362 has been located on the same site in Via di Monserrato. This is just adjacent to the Piazza Farnese, marked out there with number 706, and the huge um, Farnese Palace, marked out with this big building in 705. So the Farnese family, who had originally um, commissioned the gardens, had a close relationship with the college, with Eduardo Farnese assuming the role of Cardinal Protector of the college, through until his death in 1626. So the proximity was not merely geographic. Um, before we move on to the Farnese Gardens themselves, we'll talk a little bit about the background of Jesuit gardens. So from 1579, the English College was run under Jesuit administration through until the suppression of the Jesuit order in 1773. And as the cultural phenomenon of gardens was central to the concerns of early modern Europe, it is not surprising to find a Jesuit contribution to such a central cultural phenomenon, which could be also be seen to have a place in the educational formation of the Christian citizen. 
This is particularly evident, for example, in the gardens of Sant'Andrea al Quirinale in Rome, which were restored and rebuilt after they were donated to the society in 1566, shortly after the Farnese gardens themselves were built. Louis Richiom, who was master of the novices at Sant'Andrea until 1618, in his book La Pange Spirituale, provides a lengthy description of the site of the Church of Sant'Andrea, its novitiate complex, its gardens, and the Church of San Vitale situated at the far end of the site. Book 6 of La, La Pange Spirituale describes an imaginary walk through the gardens, accompanied by a discussion of the spiritual implications of each element encountered on the various terraces, as well as for the garden as a unified whole, which had the capacity to illuminate the soul through the programmatic nature of the passage through the gardens. The English College's desire to add such a garden property to their portfolio thus probably reflects the increasing concern with gardens as a form of spiritual devotion in Jesuit literature and thought during the 16th and 17th centuries. The Farnese family themselves also had close ties with the Jesuit order. Pope Paul III, another Alessandro Farnese, and grandfather of the Alessandro who commissioned the gardens, had in 1540 approved the founding of the Society of Jesus. The same Alessandro Farnese who commissioned the gardens would later fund the construction of the Chiesa del Gesù, the mother church of the Jesuit order, providing strict instructions for its design and layout. He would later be buried there, as would his nephew Odoardo Farnese, with whom the Farnese gardens are closely, also closely associated due to his extensive interest in botany. The architect Vignola was commissioned to design and build the summer residence and gardens. He collaborated extensively with the Farnese family throughout his life, becoming their family architect, and also designing the Villa Farnese at Caprola from 1566, including its gardens and water features, the Palazzo Farnese in Piacenza from 1558, and the Chiesa del Gesù from 1568, the mother church of the Jesuit order. So moving on to the gardens themselves now. So they were built on a series of terraces rising up the hillside, similar to those at Santa Andrea, with the main sections flat atop the Palatine. So the gardens at the Palatine were organised in classical style, uh, divided into quadrants which derive from classical peristyle buildings and in accordance with the Italian Renaissance concern with symmetry and perspective. This concern reflected the Renaissance resurgence um, in interest in the classical style, and Vignola himself had written multiple treatises on classical architecture. He made his first trip to Rome in 1540 with the intention of observing Roman architecture to produce an illustrated edition of the Trivius, though this was never completed. Vignola's 1562 treatise, Regola delle Cinque Ordini Rules of the Five Orders of Architecture, explained his system of constructing columns according to classical orders, using the proportions taken from his own measurements of Roman monuments. The classical influence and concern with symmetry in the gardens is evident on the pairs of staircases proceeding up the terraces, which start at the left of the screen, the dual aviaries and the quadrant layout on the main levels. As in the gardens at Sant'Andrea, the Farnese gardens display several features identified by Richiam as being inherently spiritual. The function of the Farnese gardens is different to those at Sant'Andrea, as they were designed to be part of a summer estate rather than part of a Jesuit novitiate complex. However, they align with several principles of a spiritual garden, which are proposed by Richiom, reflecting the inherent belief in gardens as, as spiritual allegory in Seicento, Rome. Similarly situated on various terrace levels, the uppermost garden can be seen as a paraphrase of paradise, representing the very first garden created by God, with the central fountain symbolising the fountain of life. The variety and intensity of flora and fauna on the top level, which alludes to images of paradise, is also apparent in the Farnese gardens, to an even greater extent than the gardens at Sant'Andrea, due to Eduardo Farnese's extreme interest in botany and cultivation of non-native, rare and exotic plants. According to Richiam, the copiousness of the creation of species of plants and flowers could only be attributed to the creator, with man utilising the garden as a method of appreciation for the creator's work. As witnotes, these were quite standard elements of the pleasure garden in early 17th century Rome, and in many respects the Jesuit garden was similar to the generic villa or suburban garden. 
That elements in Rishyam's book are so clearly identifiable in not just the Farnese gardens, but in many other 17th century Roman gardens, demonstrates that the typical 17th century garden was an opportunity not just for the eminent botanical collector, but also the spiritual devotee. The gardens contained all the elements necessary for devotional exercise, and thus combined Roman architectural ideals with Christian doctrine, creating a perfect combination for the eminent cardinal who would build the gardens. So although the gardens were originally commissioned by Alessandro Farnese, it's on the left in the picture, um, his nephew Odoardo Farnese is more significant in both in the botanical aspects of the gardens as well as their relationship with the Venerable English College. So Odoardo Farnese was the cardinal protector of the English College until his death in 1626, and he is known for his extensive patronage of the arts as well as his interest in botany. He was one of the more important figures in 17th century Rome in the circles of botanical collectors, putting together an extensive portfolio of rare plants, both in the Palatine Gardens as well as the Giardino Segreto, the secret garden behind the Farnese Palace, just off but next to the Venerable English College, which was accessible only via a bridge from the main building. The 1625 Exactissima Descriptio Rariorum Quarundum Plantarum documents his possession of American and Asian imports in the Palatine Gardens, providing detailed inventories, and he was held in high regard as a supplier of seeds and beans. Both the Farnese Gardens on the Palatine and Odoardo's Giardino Segreto demonstrate this preoccupation with the idea of collecting. The secret garden and the gardens on the Palatine were home to extensive, unique and rare specimens of plants, and of particular note was a large tropical section. Farnese recorded some of the first documentation in Italy of some species of plants. The Acacia Farnesiana is named after him, after he first imported it from Santo Domingo and was listed in the Aldini 1625 inventory of Farnese's botanic holdings. Rare and exotic plants were also key to Jesuit gardens. The gardens in San Vitale in Rome, for example, accumulated specimens with a dual purpose. Firstly, to excite wonder and visitors, um, thus bringing them closer to the creator, and secondly, to prepare Jesuit novices for missions on other continents. It was not just the plants themselves that were intended to impress. Alessandro Farnese had been one of the eminent collectors of antiquities, and as in common with other 17th century Roman gardens, they were put on display to complement the garden. The Giardino Segreto had a further function for the exhibition of statues and holdings by the Farnese family. The flowers of the secret garden also find place in the floral themes of the statues and the painting inside, paintings inside Odoardo's Camerino, his private study. This brought nature into harmony with created objects, intensifying the relationship between man and the divine. The garden, however, managed a careful balance between the collection as a material possession and demonstration of wealth and botanical prowess with spiritual functions. The spiritual element of the garden was also emphasised as a key part of religious practice for cardinals. Cardinal Roberto Bellamino authored the 1615 book Scala di Salire con la mente a Dio per mezzo delle cose create, dares to ascend with the mind to God by means of created things, explaining how visible elements of nature acted as a spiritual staircase towards the creator. Bellamino also spent much time at the gardens of Sant'Andrea to complete his, his own devotional exercises. Farnese was clearly an intended recipient of the book, as a 1616 sequel was dedicated to him. Arnold Witt highlights that Lanfranco's decoration of Farnese's Camerino, his private study, which heavily draws on nature, can be grasped through Bellamino's book on the devotional interpretation of the visible world. It is therefore clear that the gardens and nature were to be interpreted also on a spiritual level. So the archives of the English College provide us with an overview of the more practical side of the management of 17th century Roman gardens. While the students of the English College likely would have enjoyed the gardens for their, their aesthetic and spiritual aspects, the College's ownership of both the Farnese Gardens on the Palatine, as well as another set of gardens in the Palatine area at San Gregorio, means that documentation from the archives often shows the more practical administrative element of possessing garden complexes. For example, 
17th century receipts attest to the cost of building and maintenance work completed on both the garden sites of the Palatine and San Gregorio, in one case being later used as evidence in a lawsuit pertaining to a dispute over the work carried out. The documents detailing the litigation between the English College and the builder Dionisio Nisi in 1656-57 show that cowboy builders are not just a modern phenomenon. After being paid for building work in the gardens, Nisi scarpered, leaving a botched job. This shows that while gardens were highly regarded for their spiritual aspects, there often came more practical problems in their maintenance. So as Odoardo Farnese was the Cardinal Protector of the English College, upon his death in 1626, the students of the college commemorated him through the creation of a funerary memorial in the absence of his body, which was at the time in Parma. This consisted of a series of large wooden panels to be erected at the Jesu in Rome, with a series of eight sonnets in the different languages spoken by the subjects of the college, as well as Latin poetry, and a series of paintings largely depicting nature and landscapes. A book detailing the plans for this structure, as well as the text for the poems and draft sketches of the paintings, has survived in the archives, giving us a rare example of what would have been a very ephemeral object. The book represents a melting pot of cultures, with the eight sonnets written in Roman, Tuscan, English, Latin, Greek, Welsh, Irish and French. Common to the sonnets is naturally Farnese and his devotion to botany. The emphasis on botany brings back the recurring theme of nature, bringing the soul into closer harmony with the creator, here also as a means of spiritual ascension. They demonstrate the importance of the gardens, not just to Farnese himself, but also to the subjects of the English college. Throughout the sonnets, a focus on the funerary lily, also the symbol of the Farnese family, harmonises the collection through a common theme of flowers. Farnese's significance in botanical circles is highlighted by the phrase Re dei fiori, king of flowers, in the Tuscan sonnet. The verbal parallel with Re delle stelle, king of the stars, brings together the earthly and heavenly elements of his life through the means of nature, in this case the flower, by which giving him a means of spiritual ascension towards the creator. In the English sonnet, the phrase heaven-born plant further develops this relationship between the human and the divine through nature, highlighting Farnese's contribution to the botanical world and the importance of gardens, not just in the horticultural world, but also for the students of the English college and as a spiritual and devotional exercise. So in the 18th century, after the gardens had begun to enter into decline, the Grand Tour contributed to a resurgence in visitors. The figures walking in the bottom of the Labruzzi watercolour from the beginning of this presentation were likely to have been Grand Tourists, and many people of note visited the Farnese Gardens on the Palatine, which would have been a popular stop owing to its proximity to and view over the Roman Forum and Colosseum, as shown by Labruzzi. One such grand tourist was the famous German author Goethe, who in his journal Italianische Reise relates his tour around Italy and in September 1787 describes a trip to the gardens. His account focuses on the communal nature of the gardens, its purpose for outdoor gatherings, as well as a space used for the appreciation of both man-made and natural beauty. So in the 19th century, the gardens experienced a significant decline after numbers of grand tourists began to decrease, leading to a state of disrepair. In 1850, much of the area was already being used to other purposes, including vineyards and orchards. In 1861, however, Napoleon III, who had a long-standing interest in Julius Caesar, sought to excavate the Palatine Palaces of the Caesars and acquire the site of the gardens as part of a plan to investigate the wider Palatine area. While the Farnese family, being great collectors of antiquities, had already uncovered a lot of the more portable remains for their great collection, little had been done in terms of excavations, although a preliminary 1838 survey had shown that there was probably little left. Between 1862 and 1867, the various areas on the Palatine were excavated by the archaeologist Pietro Rosa under the Empress' supervision, unveiling ruins including the Imperial Palace with its reception and banqueting rooms. Throughout the 20th century, the gardens remained in disrepair, disturbed by the excavations and holding little public interest. However, 
Following a restoration project begun in 2013, the gardens have reopened to the public as part of the Roman Forum site. While representing only a small area of the original gardens, and with most of the original structures having been lost, the steps up the various levels of the terraces with the fountain and Avery's perch at the top have been fully restored. As you can see, the restored Avery is in the picture, still bear a remarkable symmetrical aspect, which is also clear in the Giuseppe Vasi um, etching, with the dual Avery's up here, marking out sim the symmetrical aspects and concerns of Renaissance architecture, also complemented by the dual pairs of stairs rising up the different levels. So part of this can still be experienced today. So the gardens can once again be visited and you can view the Roman Forum from the top of the Palatine in the 16th century garden. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope this is interesting and it inspires some of you to visit this wonderful site when it is next possible um, when Italy reopens. Thank you and send any questions you've got to the MEMSA email address.